Hey, what's up guys? Welcome to another one. So I just thought it would be cool to do a little racket history video since I'm going through a bunch of racket changes now and I've made a couple of videos recently like why aren't extended rackets popular and I also made a video about, you know, me being sick of the old saying that it's the player, not the racket. So those videos actually sparked some conversation that made me realize that there's probably some value in me just sort of going back in my racket history a little bit and also sharing that journey with you guys. So my intention here is to talk about the rackets, as far as I can recall, at least the ones that I had that I stuck with and what my tennis was kind of like at the time and maybe the way in which it influenced my tennis, because I can remember that there's certain pivotal moments in my uh, racket history where I can, I can pinpoint that this racket was responsible for me changing my tennis in this way or something like that. So, um, yeah, I guess I'll just tell you a little bit about my tennis history personally. So let me crack open a cold one first with the boys, which is you guys. And it's literally just seltzer water because I don't drink beer really. And I definitely don't drink soda. I wonder if I'm more likely to drink soda or beer. Jeez, that's a tough one. Oh my God, that hits the spot sometimes. Uh, I love that just like cold carbonation, but there's really no flavor to it. It's just the sensation of like purity. It's, it's really refreshing. Um, sometimes I put lemon or ginger, uh, ginger juice in there which is a really intense flavor, both of which, you know, lemon and ginger, it's just, it really kicks you, but uh, I love it. Anyway, I played tennis from like ages, maybe eight to almost 10, and I quit for almost 10 years because I had this coach, and you know, you're eight, nine, 10 years old, you don't really have the means to like make any friends, and if you do, um, I don't even know if it really occurs to you to uh, ask your parents to set up tennis with your other friend and get in touch with their parents. You know what I mean? Like when you're a little kid, and you, there wasn't really social media or anything like that. There's just no way to make tennis friends and then like keep them and set tennis up. So like really the only tennis I played was with me and my coach. And I, and I kept telling my coach that I wanted to just play more, but he kept insisting on drilling and drilling, right? Because you want to get better. You want to get better. But, uh, the irony is that, is that I just quit because I got so sick of it. So, you know, <laughs> how'd that go coach? Um, anyway, I, I found my love to come back to tennis sometime when I was maybe 18 or something. And yeah, I just couldn't stop. So anyway, I, I, when I was 18 and I came back to tennis, I had this old Dunlop racket and I'm not going to try to look up what the racket was. It was some big five racket. It was like some top shelf, big five racket, right? So maybe it cost about 70 or $80 at the time. And I think it was one of those head heavy, but really light rackets. So probably nine point something ounces and a few points head heavy, I'm guessing. I, I think that's probably pretty close, but by my standards now, that racket is absolute trash. I hate that kind of balance. And I, and I actually fundamentally believe that even a beginner racket or a beginner player should not be getting a racket that is super light and head heavy. I feel like you should just get a racket that's maybe around, I don't know, nine and a half to 10 and a half ounces, but is at least balanced or a little bit head light because I get the idea of why a racket is so light and head heavy in the first place, right? It's because it's light, so it's easy to maneuver, but it's so head heavy that it's actually kind of awkward to maneuver. But the idea is that the weight is in the head so that the power comes through and all that stuff, yada, yada. But the thing is once a racket or a, a tennis player gets better and then they want to get a real racket, then the racket that they get from that one is nothing like it. Suddenly this racket is an ounce heavier and it's head light. So it's just, it just, to me, it just seems like a really disorienting change when you could have, since you're a beginner and you don't know anything, you might as well just get a racket that you'll grow into it as opposed to grow out of immediately. That's, that's my philosophy. I really think, <laughs> I don't want to just say, I really think that I'm right, but I really think that those head heavy, super light rackets are just terrible tennis rackets. And you really shouldn't start off that way anyway. And since you're a beginner, just start off with something better. I, I, I really, you know, even just go on the used market. If you're trying to save money, cause you're a beginner, just go on the used market, get a racket that was good, but maybe on the retail market, like seven or eight years ago or something. So I don't know. Uh, I think beginners are doing themselves a disservice by, mm, I don't know, just walking into a tennis shop. Hey, I don't know anything about tennis. Can you sell me something? Right. So that, and they also get a grip size. That's too big. Cause I feel like every tennis shop just goes straight to like four and three eighths, which is just way too big for most people. I, I have big hands myself. I'm six foot three and I have a semi Western forehand and stuff. I prefer four and a quarter, but sometimes four and one eighth, just so I can build it up myself. I really think that people are way too quick to get a grip size that is way too big. And unless you have like an Eastern style of grip, I would probably recommend starting at four and a quarter and really seeing if, uh, if that's too big or too small, I wouldn't just start at four and three. I, I just don't think that that's the way to do it. But 
Anyway, that's a, a long tangent. Let me get back on track here. So I got back into tennis when I was 18. I played with that terrible Dunlop racket for I don't know how long after I got back into it. Maybe a few months, maybe several months, maybe not. I don't remember. But at some point, I decided to get myself a real tennis racket. And I was demoing a little bit at my local tennis shop. And some group that I was in, some tennis group that I was in, like a bunch of uh, kind of like senior guys, uh, some Korean group. And I guess they had a church thing and they would also play tennis on Tuesdays and Thursdays or something like that and I and I joined them and I'm not Korean but I joined them <laughs> which is funny because I was like the only non-Korean person in that group but they were nice to me and I hit with those guys and one of those guys had this racket here that I have on the screen it was the Aero Pro Drive uh, probably from 2013 that looks like the one that I knew or remember and that was I think the racket that I wanted I tried a few but something about that one just felt really good I didn't really question it too much and I loved how it looked I've always been a sucker for that little cortex sleeve, by the way. Um, I talked about how I was in a video I did talking about selling the pure drives. I, I just have a soft spot for that cortex sleeve. I just, it's a cool accessory on the racket that really kind of stands, uh, it stands apart from the others in that way. So, uh, yeah, that was the racket I wanted and that was the racket I got. And I stuck with that for like a year. I probably developed my tennis a lot in that year or so. And I was a pretty heavy topspin player already, but I think that racket took it up a notch and I kind of knew that that was a topspin racket, but I also felt like it just agreed with the way that I wanted to hit. Um, that's why it probably felt so good when I tried it for my friend. It wasn't one of the rackets I was demoing, but I just tried his for a little bit because I was like, hey, could I hit with that? I'm curious about it. And uh, I just loved it. So that was my racket for some time. And then I eventually got really sick of... Uh, how much I felt like I always had to hit topspin because I remember at some point it occurred to me that I just wanted to be able to drive through the ball sometimes I don't always want to brush over it so much and I remember trying to do that and I could really feel as though the racket was just struggling to penetrate through the ball unless I would brush over it so sometimes that happens like I'll have this idea and then it just makes it so that I feel completely different about my racket and then I can't really see past that so that was really bothering me. I wanted to try some new stuff in my tennis and I'm like, this racket just is not allowing it. I really feel like it's the racket just not letting me play like this. So I remember putting some lead on it for a bit and I, I probably put lead around the three and nine and I still felt like it wasn't playing the way I wanted to. And I just thought, how much lead am I gonna have to put on this racket to just completely change it? And I just said, I think it's the racket. Lead is only gonna do so much. I want something different. So. Without even demoing, I literally just had it in my head. I want to get something completely different from the from this AeroPro drive. I want to get something that has like a box beam shape. And this was like, this was sort of around the time that I started to become aware of different beam shapes. So I think that uh, the AeroPro racket or the Babolat like pure drive and AeroPro are kind of in their own league in terms of this oval shaped beam. But I re I remember distinctly just thinking I want something that is basically as far away from this AeroPro drive that I can get. I want something that has a more old school feel. I want something box beam. I want something with more flex. I want something with a smaller head size and I want something heavier. And that was what I wanted. And so what I got was the Prince Textream Tour 95. And I don't think I even demoed the racket. I might've, but I don't remember. So this is not a racket that's really popular. Um, I don't think Prince was a popular brand. Oh, these pictures are not zooming in as much as I want, but you can see it's a box beam. Um, yeah, I mean, I was kind of a sucker for that hoop, the green inside and the black outside. I just thought that was cool. So this racket was on my radar pretty quickly and I got it and I really liked it. And I felt like it allowed me to do a lot of the stuff that uh, I wanted to do that the AeroPro drive was not allowing me to do. But I also just really kind of rejected a lot of things about the AeroPro drive. And I just wanted something really different just to have something different because I'm like, I just want to get away from this kind of racket. And so I had this racket for quite a while i guess i mean maybe a year or so maybe a little bit longer it's a little blurry i don't remember exactly but and it was great my tennis was very i was very happy with my tennis i felt like i, I had more versatile shots i didn't always have to brush over the ball i could hit through it a little more if i wanted to but i also didn't notice like a loss of spin necessarily maybe there was but i didn't really notice um and that was my racket for a while and i got a second one later on and I remember the first thing I did when I got the second racket was put lead under the grommets at the three and nine. And I remember that racket feeling like absolute trash. And I thought maybe the quality control is just terrible. Like why would weight at the three and nine dramatically change how this racket felt so much? I just didn't, I wasn't really willing to accept that. And now that I know what I know about rackets and how weight 
on the three and nine affects the way that the racket wants to go through the ball. I now understand several years later that the, that what I did to that racket is exactly why it felt the way that it did. Because every time I do that to a racket now, it does the same exact thing. It, it changes the racket to feel that way. And what that does that I didn't understand at the time is that it really makes it so that your racket just wants to go straight through the ball. It almost wants, it almost makes it so that you want to hit the ball more. So like you're hitting a ball with a baseball bat. Like you just want to pound right through it as opposed to have this kind of brushy sort of over the ball technique with a lot of top spin. It really just favors the physics of a trajectory that just goes right through the ball like you're hitting a damn baseball with a baseball bat. That's really what it wants to do. And I've, and I've done that experiment plenty of times and that's always been the case for me. Um, otherwise, it actually feels like the racket struggles to go through the ball, which is strange because you have more weight on the racket and you try to brush over it, but the, but it somehow feels like the racket is, is hitting a wall somehow, which is so strange. Like I put weight on the racket, but now it feels like it won't go through the ball. It's not intuitive, but I think what's happening is on contact, there's a lot of stuff that's kind of correcting the axis of the racket, like the, the head, the head angle relative to the ball and the trajectory is something there's all this like correctional stuff that's happening in that moment of contact and that's why the racket feels like it's getting stuck uh, but if you have weight at the three and nine and didn't before and you start adjusting your stroke so that you go straight through the ball as opposed to this brushy over the ball technique you might find that the racket just pounds right through the ball um, and doesn't give you that sort of brick wall feeling so Anyway, I got rid of that one racket and uh, I stayed with that 95 for a while with no modifications and I liked it, but I think I just wanted something different. And, and honestly, if I think back, I can't quite remember what I wanted at the time, but I think putting lead at the three and nine on that one kind of messed with my idea of the racket because I didn't understand why it changed that much anyway. And so maybe I started to doubt the quality control a little bit, but maybe I just wanted something different also. And what ended up happening was that I later on got the Wilson Pro Staff RF97. So this is not the same generation. I think the one before this, I think I got one in like maybe 2014 or something like that. Um, I don't know if it's really changed much or not, but I think it's virtually the same racket. Um, I know that I wanted something heavier, I think, when I when I had that 95, because I had that idea like it's not going through the ball quite as well, so I wanted something heavier, and um, I think I just wanted something new, you know? Sometimes you just get tired of how your racket looks, or maybe you want something a little different, you, you know? I mean, I probably got partly excited by superficial things, but also probably by some specs that I thought would work better for my tennis, or I was just intrigued by, intrigued by so much that I just wanted to get the racket instead of, like, really tell myself, eh, it's the player, not the racket. So <laughs> um, I had the Pro Staff, and that was one of my favorite rackets of all time. If I look back to it, I really uh, loved and got along with that racket. I felt like it really gave me everything I wanted. I got along with that racket so well. I uh, liked it enough to give it a custom paint job eventually myself, but then it turned out that the way in which you're able to paint things yourself, it generally doesn't... Um... The racket looked amazing, by the way. I just got to give myself some credit. that It was one of the nicest... Uh, looking paint jobs I've ever done on a racket. Ah, maybe I'll show you a picture sometime. Uh, I liked it enough to give it a custom paint job, uh, but it was a bunch of like spray paints and stuff. And I guess those never technically dry. You have to get something called like catalyzing paint, which is basically automotive grade stuff. You gotta have paint guns and all this other stuff. And I didn't have like professional painting equipment. So there's really no way for me to professionally paint my racket. Even if, even if my skills were decent, it's like the paint I was using was just inherently not gonna give me the job results I wanted. So. Um, I ended up selling those rackets for probably more than they would have gone uh, regularly just because it had a custom paint job. So I remember I eventually sold those wondering, am I going to get more or less because it's like a custom paint job? But I ended up getting more and that was cool. So that was kind of nice. I had one that was uh, white, but it had like a pink and black splatter on it. And I had a gold and I had a black one with a gold splatter on it. And those two rackets looked sick and people liked those a lot. Um... But when you go to string them, you had to be so careful not to let the, the string like rub on the throat of the racket or else it would take the paint off with it, which is unfortunate. But I had that racket for quite some time, maybe again like another year and a half or something like that. Maybe a, l a little longer than my other ones, I feel like. It might have been two years, I'm not totally sure. But I really like that racket and uh, I started hitting with this guy who's like a 6-0 level player. He was uh, ranked... He was ranked somewhere around like 1100 on the ATP, like he had ATP points and he was ranked just outside of the top 1000. Um, this guy was ranked top, top like 70 in the nation um, here in America. So he was a really rid ridiculously good tennis player, just unbelievable tennis, so consistent, so much power, um, just everything, you know. I remember getting him on like a really tricky lob. 
and I and I thought the only way that he can get this ball is with like a sick tweener. And I was just looking at him. I'm like, I know he's going to do it. I know he's so good that he's just going to get that ball. He's going to hit it right between his legs, and I'm probably not going to be able to get it. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. Like I wasn't even surprised. I just knew this guy's that good. He's going to do this unbelievable shot. Um, and there he goes. <laughs> that's what he did. But uh, hitting with him actually made me realize, oh shit, this RF97 is too heavy for me. So I was hitting with like a bunch of four fives and stuff, um, and I could keep up with that racket. But this guy, his pace was next level. Like the consistency and the pace, um, I started. I realized that this racket is it's too heavy for me. I think I can't keep up with this guy. So that made me want to change rackets. If I want to, if I want to hit better, or if I want to hit with higher level guys, I think I have to change rackets. This is legitimately too heavy. I actually remember when I when I got this racket. I think uh, my mindset going into it was that I want to get a racket that's a little bit too heavy for me, so that I have to clean up my tennis a little bit to get along with the weight. Either I, I get stronger, or my take back gets a little bit cleaned up, and I learn to cooperate with the weight a little bit more. That was my mindset getting the RF-97. And the RF-97 was another racket that I did not demo. I just straight up got it and I liked it and I loved it. Um, it doesn't always work that way. There's a couple rackets that I bought that were basically just a complete like emotional decision. And this was one of them and it worked out great. I've had other ones that did not work out that way. And the, uh, that Vocal V8 is one of those rackets, um, which I'm selling like immediately. <laughs> um, so anyway, I hit with a guy that was super ridiculously good at tennis in it and it finally exploited the reality that this racket was too heavy for me and that ra and that reality never mattered until i hit with somebody that good so that's kind of the thing about these rackets is that whether or not a racket is too heavy or too light for you it, it's it's kind of only true to a point like it's only true until you hit with a guy that's really going to demand that you 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 take your racket back as quickly as possible and as efficiently as possible or else you won't have enough time or power to get that ball back and that's exactly what he did his balls were so deep and so fast that it really it required me to like try my absolute best just to hang in there for as long as possible. And that was exhilarating. I loved playing that tennis, but I could tell that, wow, this racket is freaking heavy. Um, and, I, and it also occurred to me that maybe it's kind of like when a beginner player relies too much on the racket for power um, and they want like a light racket that gives them a lot of power. I felt like maybe I'm relying on my racket's weight too much for stability. I should really provide my own stability. So I don't need a racket that was like 13 ounces because that's what mine was set up to be. I had a leather base grip on there and a custom paint job which added a little bit of weight. So my racket was like right around 13 ounces which is heavy. It's very heavy. So I thought maybe I need to drop down to like the high 11s or the low 12s or something because I don't want to get like a weak a weak racket but I, I think 13 ounces is a little bit too much so that uh prompted me to want to change rackets but i think around that time also i uh, went to italy there's a racket called the h19 and this is my introduction to pro stock rackets so this is a wilson h19 and it looks like a blade it looks like this blade from a couple generations ago but it is not. I don't remember everything about it. So the racket that I hit with was actually an 18 by 20 racket. And I think there's H19s out there that come with different specs. I don't think they're all made the same because it's it's a pro stock racket and they're made to, uh, they're made with a lot of adjustments depending on where you get the pro stock racket. Here's an 18 by 20 H19. Anyway, when I tried this racket, I was in Italy and it was my friends and I didn't, I didn't travel to Italy with my rackets, but at the time my regular racket was the pro staff. So he gave me this and it was pretty similar, but it was a night, it was an 18 by 20. And I just loved how it felt. It felt so dense and so plush. And I felt like I was able to do everything well with it. Um, it might've been a little too heavy for me. I didn't notice it at the time, but had I hit with that guy, uh, that I was talking about that ridiculous, like six O level player. Um, I might have also felt that it's too heavy for me, but damn if that racket didn't feel amazing I felt like it had so much touch, but it also had power if I wanted it to and it just it really Felt like one of the most versatile and high quality rackets that had characteristics that I didn't even like really believe could exist in one racket and So that that made me want to look for a racket that that gave me kind of what the h19 gave me so I uh, thought maybe it has something to do with the string pattern and my friend kind of talked me into 18 by 20s and I demoed quite a lot of rackets after that when I came back from Italy but I, I landed on the Head Gravity Pro. So this is the newest Head Gravity Pro. The one that I had was more like teal and red in color I think um, and this is the new color but I don't think they changed anything. But I was really uh, intrigued by this racket, the, just the fact that it's a 100 square inch head size, but it's also got this kind of cool teardrop shape, but it's also an 18 by 20, and it's got kind of a thin beam thing going on. So I thought this is a really interesting racket. It's got like a lot of 
specs that maybe seem not quite like what I'm looking for, but then it has some other ones that are really what I'm looking for in a, in a way that I thought maybe this kind of addresses that. Like it's a big head size, but it's an 18 by 20. Um, or it's a big head size, but it's also kind of a thin box-ish beam type of thing. So I, I thought maybe this racket's worth trying. And so I demoed that along with several others. I think I demoed a blade like 18 by 20 at the time. I didn't love it. It was okay. Um, I demoed a bunch of stuff. Whatever the case is, none of them really stuck with me. I think I demoed some Yonex at the time, maybe a V-Core Pro or something like that. I think that was the same generation of rackets when they introduced the Yonex HD, but I think I tried the 16 by 19. It was the same generation, kind of that dull green color. I didn't like it too much, but it was okay. I was hitting really well with the Head Gravity Pro though, so I just didn't question it. And I was hitting again with that guy uh, that 6L level dude. Yeah, he also agreed that that was probably what the racket I was playing my best tennis with too. So I just, I went with that one and that was my racket for like another year. But then I, I got into this idea about pro stock rackets and this, uh, you know, like a year or so after that head gravity pro, I started to want to maybe extend my racket cause I just got really intrigued with the idea of extending my racket. So I don't have any more tabs to show you, but essentially after that I got like I got a head gravity pro stock and it was 27.7 inches. Um, I had that for a while. I had the Ezo 98 at 27.5 for a while. I had a few rackets. Um, for a while, those were my two main rackets, but I felt like they were both temporary. And I ultimately sold the E zone and then I stuck with my pro stock and I wanted to buy another one, but I'm like, this is really expensive. I'm paying like $450 for a racket. But I also felt like, uh, and this is a pro stock racket, the, the, the mold and, and the layup and all that stuff is, is a little bit different than the retail one. So I couldn't really tell like what characteristics are coming from the fact that this is a pro stock racket. So I ultimately felt like that racket was, I was losing power somewhere, somewhere on my ground strokes. Like it was just swallowing my power a little bit and I didn't like that, but I knew that I wanted to stay with extended length rackets. So that's kind of where my journey started for the, for finding an extended length racket. And I've already made a video on that. Um, talking about the rackets that I went through. So ever, basically ever since that Head Gravity Pro, I don't really feel like I had a regular racket ever since then. And the rackets that I even had after that, I felt like were maybe temporary rackets that they weren't quite what I was looking for. Cause me getting that E zone 98, it was me kind of going back to eight, uh, 18 or uh, 16 by 19 string patterns. And I never wanted to do that. I only did that because that was the only thing available on the retail market really it was a bunch of 16 by 19 options. Um, and then there was a couple others, like an 18 by 19, but it's this ridiculous Serena racket that feels terrible. And then there's that Prince uh, 16 by 18 that also just feels like a really stupid racket. It's 28 inches, which is fine, but it's uh, just not a good racket. I really don't think so. Um, yeah, ever since that head gravity, I, I felt like I've been looking for my racket. And it's been a while since I've felt like I've been looking for a racket, but now I feel like I'm really closing in on a couple of racket options that I'm happy with. Right now I have an extended uh, V-Core 95 that I really like. Uh, that's a racket I'm getting to know, but I do feel like I get along with it well and I like it enough to probably keep it for a while. Maybe I'll figure out something I don't like about it or that I like more about my Angel TC95. So right now it's between those two rackets and I think I'm gonna pick up a Babolat VS uh, Aero. No, it's a pure Aero VS. I'm gonna pick up one of those. It's a 16 by 20 slightly more control oriented aero pro drive type of racket or i guess pure aero now so that'd be cool if that's the racket i went with it'd be kind of full circle i go back to babylon and sort of get like a more control version of the aero pro drive that i once had but i think after that racket and this one custom one that i'm getting built it's it's literally like completely custom from a factory i worked with to make this racket you, it doesn't even have a brand name it's just a factory that makes rackets so um, they've made rackets for other big names, but I can't say too much about this company just because it, it, it just uh, reveals too much about who I'm working with and like the, the, the racket companies that they work with. So I'm not really supposed to talk about that, I guess, but I'm getting my racket made from a company that should be super legit. And they're making me a custom 28 inch racket that is also an 18 by 20. And that'll be here in a couple of weeks. So we'll see how that stacks up to my Angel and my Yonex. But for now, that's what I have. And I think the last racket I'm going to buy before starting to come to decisions and picking favorites is that Babolat Aero Pro or Pure Aero Versus VS. Sorry. I don't know if it's Versus or VS. Someone told me it's VS, but I thought it was Versus because they were sold as like a matched pair 
for some time, but then, uh, you know, people aren't always trying to buy two rackets at once, but yeah. Anyway, that is a bit of my racket journey and my racket history. So I just made a video on it's the player, not the racket, but it, it also made me want to talk about my racket journey because my racket journey talks about the different rackets that I went through and the way in which the racket influenced my tennis, or maybe I was looking to get something out of my tennis that was sort of beyond what I was able to deliver. Like sometimes a racket is just really designed to hit a ball in a certain way. And that's just how it is. You can make some adjustments on how you swing stuff, but to an extent you're limited to how much the racket is allowing you to hit the way that you want to hit. So when you start to reach those limitations and they really bother you, or you feel like the it's holding back your tennis in some way, or maybe your racket's too light or it's too heavy. So you're just not able to get through the ball when you start hitting with heavier players. Like that's what I, that's what happened to me. I started hitting with better players. They served harder. They had a lot more top spin on their ball. Like I needed a heavier racket. And I thought that my tennis was at a point where I can deal with more weight, but I also just needed it because these balls are too damn heavy. My racket is getting flopped around trying to uh, hit these forehands back when these guys are just absolutely bombing me. So sometimes a racket change really is necessary and I wouldn't underestimate the value of that. So I hope my story about, you know, looking for this or that spec and getting that racket. And, and I think especially right here is one of the more interesting points in my racket journey, right? So I went from the TechStream 95 to the Wilson Pro and I was looking for something more heavy and maybe more stable. And that was great for a while. It definitely gave me all that. But then I, then I got to another growth point where I was hitting with people that were even better. And then it kind of revealed to me that, oh, now you're relying on your racket's weight for stability. You need to be able to provide your own stability. So now it, it, it took my journey up a notch. So I went to that racket wanting to clean up my tennis, right? So I have such a heavy racket, I got to clean up my take back and everything like that. And I did that. My tennis started getting better and looking better. But then it got to a point where like, oh, I need to clean it up even more to the point that I can handle a lighter racket and still have the stability that I need. I need to clean up my tennis and optimize it so much that I can take like half an ounce or maybe a full ounce off of my racket and still have the power and stability to keep up with these guys. So that was the adjustment that I made. Um, you could have argued that maybe I just needed to get stronger or something, but... Um, I think when you start reaching points like that where you need to change or need to grow in some kind of way, it's kind of up to you to like, do you want to try to change your tennis? Do you want to try to get a lot better? Or do you want to change rackets and also get better? I ended up changing rackets and, and also wanting to get better, but I really felt like I was relying too much on the racket for stability. Um, and that just, it kind of blew my mind like that. Cause usually you, you don't think about relying on your racket for stability. You usually people talk about relying on your racket for power too much or something, you know, and that's always kind of like a beginner mistake or something. But then eventually you get good enough to the point that you think that your racket is providing you too much stability. You know what I mean? Like to the point that you're relying on it or it's like a crutch for you that just kind of opened my mind. I'm like, Oh God, like I'm at that level now where I'm, I'm making decisions like that. I just thought that was really interesting. Uh, maybe that sounds a little bit arrogant or something, but I mean, I was hitting with a six O level player. I'm not a six O level player, but it revealed to me that if I'm going to keep up with this guy, I really got to be able to, I got, I need a lighter racket. This is ridiculous. And I, and I knew all along, ever since I had that, I literally went into the pro staff knowing that it was a little bit too heavy for me. That's why I bought it. Cause I wanted, I wanted to feel that weakness in my game so that I could try to clean it up. And I did, but it wasn't good enough to the point where once I started hitting with him, that it was okay. I really felt like, okay, I can't. This is still such a heavy racket. It's not, I, I got to I just got to get another racket. So that's what I ultimately decided to do. Um, so I think that that's the, one of the more interesting forks in the road that I ran into with my racket journey. So maybe, you know, there's all kinds of things that you could run into that make you want to get a different racket and whatever that is, you know, I'm curious if you're, if you're looking for a new racket, let me know why I'm not going to be that guy. That's going to tell you it's the player, not the racket crap. Okay. I hate that kind of advice because everybody knows that that's true. But I think it completely undermines and disrespects the reality that the racket is a big part of your tennis. So sometimes you just, you know, and I said this in my other video too, the better you get, the better tennis player you are, the more your racket is going to affect your tennis, right? Because the beginner is not going to care. They're terrible at tennis. Whatever racket they have, they're probably not even swinging it right in the first place. They already have like a hundred other things they're doing wrong. It doesn't matter what racket they have. They might not even notice the difference between a nine ounce racket and a 12 ounce racket. They really might not because they're so insensitive to how it's affecting their tennis. Whereas like a more refined tennis player that's hit millions of forehands, like you're going to know the difference. So the better you are, the more seriously I think you should take the effect of a racket on your tennis. So I just wanted to say that because that's another point that most people don't consider. The better you are, the more your racket changes matter. So yeah, anyway. 
it was a bit of a rant and a bit of my tennis history. Um, let me know if you guys are looking for a new racket, what you're looking for. I'm just, I'm just curious, like where you're at with your racket journey, or maybe tell me a little bit about your racket journey in the past and how it affected your tennis. So yeah, I'll see you guys in the comments and I'll see you guys in the future videos. Please like and subscribe if you enjoyed the content. I'll be making more. Um, and thanks again for your comments because uh, sometimes they inspire me to make content. So my la some of the comments I got on my last video inspired me to make this video so it's great that it kind of go back and forth like that and you know everybody's winning right we're all inspiring each other so i will see you guys in the next one um yeah i suppose that's all i have to say for now thanks for watching take care bye